Hey, everybody. Welcome back to a new installment of the VIP table here at the Basement Lounge Podcast. My name is Mike Shea. I'll be your host again today. And uh, we've got a very special guest you guys are really going to enjoy. We're going to have some fun on the show. I want to remind you guys, this show is sponsored by Poddex. Poddex is the number one way for you to supplement your podcasting game, whether you're a newbie or a veteran. You get decks of cards with episode ideas, interview questions of all different types as well as cool merchandise like hats and t-shirts head on over to poddex.com use the code tbl10 that's tbl10 get 10 percent off your total purchase at checkout and i may or may not get a kickback it is what it is that being said let's move on let's bring on our guest for this week uh she is a tarot card reader uh broadway aficionado all kinds that we're going to, we're going to learn all about. I I don't want, I don't want to spoil anything right now, but we're going to have a lot of fun with this person. Let's bring on Emily McGill, Emily McGill. Welcome to the VIP table. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. You've got a background in, in theater. You've got a background in, in tarot card reading. You got a background. We're going to, we're going to go into this, this thing blind and get to know you uh, fresh. Let's, let's start off because I'm I'm an old theater kid. Mm -hmm. I really want to talk about this Broadway stuff. I want to know like where that started for you. Where, where, where did the acting bug first bite you? Oh, man. My parents put me in dancing school when I was three years old, two and a half, because, you know, you need somewhere to get all that energy out. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was 12, I got hit by the bug, the stage bug uh, for musical theater. And uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh. So we I went to a conservatory there, you know, school did it in college, already knew that I didn't want to be a performer by the time I graduated from college. But I didn't really know that there were other options in the theater to have a job besides being on stage or being like on stage crew. Right. Mm -hmm. And you move to New York and you find out there's an entire business ecosystem around this. There are people that work in marketing, advertising, general and company management and the day to day management of the show. Um, You know, you have a a publicity office, you've got the digital marketing team, you know, there are so many different people that it takes to put together a show. And um, I landed in a PR office and started doing Broadway PR and just absolutely fell in love with it. So I've been doing um, PR now I call it. Sorry, that's on my end. And I thought I turned everything off. (laughs) It's okay. so I, I, uh, I started doing PR for Broadway shows and uh, I absolutely loved it. Now I consider myself more of a communications consultant. I think that PR is one aspect of a much larger conversation about how we communicate with the world, what our ideas are, how we express ourselves. And artists and creatives always have these amazing, like crazy abstract ideas and oftentimes struggle with how to communicate that information into the world. And so that's sort of where I come in on my PR communication side, um, especially working with people that are sort of at the intersection of technology and theater, looking to push forward what is possible. You know, this pandemic has taught us that theater on the internet is not as crazy of an idea as we once thought it was. And so, you know, working with people that are looking to now move into all kinds of different digital theatrical ideas. So it's been really exciting, despite that challenges of you know an entire industry being shut down over the last 15 months yeah that's been great um <laughs> <laughs> i've seen a lot of it you know because everybody who was stuck at home you know as, as a podcaster suddenly everybody was like i'm gonna start a podcast now and but what was great was and, and these were a thing before was i was seeing so many um scripted podcasts that yeah. were done as a as a fictional series i was part of one myself and uh so yeah, finding those new avenues to to translate, to do a medium transfer of mm-hmm. different styles of entertainment has been a lot of fun. And you you mentioned the the importance of being the communications consultant, how the PR is one aspect. I think, and you, we see this in the film industry as well. People who are you know just the layman's people don't there's that there's that aspect of behind the scenes with with entertainment. People just just don't understand when they hear that a movie made a lot of money but didn't turn a profit and you know they don't take into account things like advertising and communications and and public relations and things that 
that factor into that as well. So um, ha- having that communications focus in the in the inter- in the entertainment world like you do do you find that it's um kind of shaped or maybe uh, tweaked your perspective on on theater in general absolutely it's given me such a different perspective on entertainment period you know not just live events or live theater but uh, or live entertainment period. You know, I've worked <laughs> on all kinds of different things in my career. Yes, I started in Broadway, but have had the opportunity to work on films and TV shows and streaming projects and HBO documentaries. And I've worked with, you know, I worked once on the Nobel Peace Prize concert. I've worked with, um, yeah, I've worked with male strippers, like not kidding. It's really run the gamut. Uh-huh. You know, so I mean, literally Nobel Peace Prize concert and like a gay string quartet to male strippers, you know, like it really goes far. <laughs> Which, what's what you got going on this weekend? Well, I got to go plan a, a black tie thing for the for the Nobel Peace Corps. And then I'm hanging out with uh, with 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 the black diamonds. Uh, how, like, <laughs> no, it's, yeah. Magic men live. There was no magic. They were just men. <laughs> <laughs> and they were the kindest, sweetest guys from Michigan that just happened to take their clothes off for a living, you know, but, uh, but it really, you're right. It does. It gives you a whole new perspective on what it takes to put something together. You know, we never really consider, and I think film is probably the easiest way for most people to understand it. You hear that, you know, a film is being made, that it has been cast, that it is being shot, you know, a good example that a lot of people were obsessing over were like these pictures that were coming of Lady Gaga and Adam Driver off of this movie about, you know, Gucci or, or uh, uh, I think it's Gucci, one of the designers where, uh, you know, they're like in all this Italian luxury and everybody can't get enough of these photos, but you don't think about how long it took for whoever's idea it was in the first place to make it. Did they have, like, was the script written already? Was it a producer that had the first idea? Did it get optioned by a studio? You know, where where did this process start? Who did it start with? There are so many different ways that projects can come to life. Um, and I think, as you said, in this pandemic, it's been so amazing. You know, one of the things that I've been saying since the beginning is that this sort of desperation breeds inspiration and creativity. And at the beginning, when everyone just didn't know what to do with themselves, all of a sudden, like you said, everyone started going, well, I can do this and I can do that and I can do this. And I think we're going to find a really interesting boom in the next probably two to three years of creative projects that started during the pandemic and will now be percolating out into the world. So I'm really excited to see the, the, the growth of the projects that were seeded during these last 15 months of, of challenge. And I think we've already seen some aspects of that. I mean, there was a, I don't know if it's still on or not, but there was a TV show that was going to freeform or something that was about people living during the pandemic. One was an elderly couple. One was a couple that had just started dating. One was some newlyweds. And, and uh, you know, we've seen it with music is, I mean, the amount of, the amount of music that's been coming out, Yep. Since this pandemic, all, all great too, because what do these people have to do other than sit around and, and just write stuff? So, uh, yep. has been has been flooring, and we've we've seen, you know, like in Law and Order, where suddenly they're having to show everybody wearing masks and how the courtrooms have changed. I mean, they can't they can't ignore it. It's right. it's a part. It's this will be talked about in history classes in twenty it's years. For history, yes, yeah. So, um, with with how how is this whole fiasco of the last year and a half um, affected you personally as far as like what you because again with with the tarot card readings and which we'll get into in a little bit and with the with the theater side of things how is how has this all affected you it really gave me an opportunity the pandemic allowed me to stop I found myself sort of on a path that I didn't really mean to end up on I was you know an independent communications consultant working with clients not really lit up as much as I had been by the work that I had been doing in the past. And so uh, it really became an opportunity to pause and reflect. I also had COVID like at the very beginning, you know, I'm in New York city. We shut down Broadway, shut down March 12th, March 13th. uh, You know, the rest of the city kind of started following 
there was marching orders. And by the end of the weekend, everything was shut down. The following weekend, I got a positive COVID test while I watched a friend of mine get married in Tennessee on YouTube. Oh, no. (laughs) Because I couldn't go to her wedding. I was, you know, and thank God I didn't because I was COVID positive. And so I spent some time just healing and reflecting and, you know, allowing my body to do what it needed to do to move through my system. I was very fortunate in that the majority of my uh, symptoms didn't, you know, I, I don't have, I don't think have the long COVID that some people have had. Um, my sense of smell and taste came back pretty quickly. You know, I have friends that are still doing, um, sense like training, you know, they have to do like physical therapy for their sm- sense of smell, which is like bonkers. <laughs> but I, I was really lucky that none of that was part of my experience. Um, but it did, it gave me a chance to, to say, okay, how did I get where I am? And what do I want to do going forward? Do I want to stay in the theater? You know, and after George Floyd was murdered, there were so many systemic issues that have previously been existing for years and years and years and years, but were finally brought more to the surface. And I do a lot of work with the Black Broadway community to begin with. I'm a co-host of a a monthly industry dance party called Snob Sunday Night on Broadway. That is, it's so lit. We have two DJs that are my partners and the music is just amazing. And we have a great time dancing and just kind of blowing off steam as a community once a month. Um, but I realized there was more I could be doing. So I started doing pro bono practices for melanated artists where they write their own press release and I then help them edit it and and make sure that it still captures their voice. And then I share it with my pretty sizable media list of live entertainment theater folks. And if anybody's interested, I'll connect that artist directly with that press person and say, here you go. And now that artist can start to cultivate their own relationship with the press. And there have been some great things, you know, there was a, a, an opera about black, a, a documentary about black opera singers that got a little mention in the New Yorker, you know, and like it, things have really come of it for some of these folks, which has been really exciting. And that felt like a direct response to what was happening in the world. I felt like I can use my tools and my place and my ability in the world to step into this sort of new age as a bit of a leader and say, no, there's more I can do. I'm so, I'm such a big, I don't want to say fan, but I'm fascinated by causality. And mm-hmm. I, I always, throughout everything that's, that's happened within this past year and a half, everything with, you know, with, with George Floyd and, and, and black lives matter. And, 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 and I, you know, you, you can't help, at least I can't help, but look at like, had we not been in this pandemic, everybody stuck at home where, there weren't as many distractions anymore, you know, how did that affect the response? Things like that. Look in the mirror over the last 15 months and, and face what faced us. And some people have done that work and some people have chosen to start exploring themselves. You know, I've also been in therapy for seven years. So I think that having done a lot of the work prior to the pandemic hitting, I was in a very privileged position that I had a lot of the tools that I needed to continue to have positive mental health throughout the process. Uh, But yeah, you're right. You know, we all have been sitting at home and saying, okay, where in the world is this coming to me? And how can I be active in making a difference? Um, or choosing to bury our head in the sand. And that's some people's choices too, right? And the world's gonna keep spinning either way. Uh, we like to invite everyone along with us into the future, moving forward, not you know getting back, right? We're looking forward to what can come from all of this, but yeah, it's I, been a process. I can, you know, and, and it's it's weird. I, I am famous for playing devil's advocate and, you know, mm-hmm. trying to see all sides of an issue. So whenever I do hear about or, or see those people who bury their head in the sand, you know, as, as somebody who is known for, you know, having to struggle with sensory overload and, and, you know, with, with mental health and all that, there are times, and, and I also, I work in, I work in news media. So there are, there are times where it's like, yeah, it can be overwhelming and I can understand the urge to, just just 
pretend it's not happening because it can it can be so overwhelming. Um, but I I also recognize you know the more that that does in the grand scheme of things kind of do more harm than good. But I also I I know a lot of people like to initially say like oh well if you're you know if you're ignoring the issues or whatever you're part of the problem. It's like not I I also feel like not everyone is equipped to de- is as equipped to handle those issues talking about them or otherwise as other people might be and it's it's hard to it's hard to walk that line sometimes for sure and i i will you know devil's advocate your devil's advocate and say that there are some people whose process mm. is to ignore it until they feel prepared to deal with it and approach it and then they move through it and that is how you know that's their process as to how they move through things I'm very much, I have a lot of those tendencies myself, you know, a lot of, I will avoid, 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 avoid until I can't any longer. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, I really have to deal with this or else I'm, you know, I'm going to have a bigger problem on my hands. Um, But I think the pandemic has taught me in the last year that even my avoidance has changed, right? Like the way I stick my head in the sand, it used to be, you know, like zoning out with games on my phone, you know, smoking a little weed and like laying in front of the TV. And, you know, yeah, sure. All of that is still in my life, but it's just the way that I do it. The feelings are allowed to come in a way that they don't necessarily feel like they're going to drown me the way they previously did. So, you know, I do see the value in having to move through your own process of, I need to stick my head in the sand. And Oftentimes it's fear-based, right? Also, it's that I'm afraid that if I face whatever this thing is in front of me, I'm not going to survive. Like, even if it's an emotional or a response, it feels like it is actually threatening your life. And, you know, how, I mean, I'm no mental health practitioner in any way, shape, or form. Let me make that very clear. But I've done a lot of this work myself and, and it has become really helpful to me to, uh, to explore it that way. And I think that's also important too, is I, at the same time, I, I, I have a heart, you know, I don't, when someone says they need to, or I, you, you see some, it's the evidence of somebody having to, you know, stick their head in the sand. I'm going to keep using that metaphor because it's great. Um, I also look at it as, I don't want them to be taking on an issue if they're not ready. Mm-hmm. You know, you want someone to be at their best to take on a serious issue. Otherwise they're probably going to it, it make it worse. Mm-hmm. So if someone says, Hey, I can't deal with this right now. I'm going to come back to it later. You have to kind of, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt and trust that when they do, they'll be in a place where when that when they do handle it, it'll actually be effective. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And that actually is a really great segue. I don't know if there are other things, but into the tarot, because tarot has helped my mental health as well. I was initially introduced to it by my therapist. (laughs) Oh, really? Yeah. She was the one I would start pulling cards with her in a session from time to time. If I didn't know how to move forward with something or had a question about something, we'd pull a card. And, um, about, I would say probably four or five years ago. Now I started looking to add a daily practice to my life. And she suggested I pull a card and I didn't own any decks. So I got downloaded an app on my phone and I started learning that way. Is it the, uh, is it the golden the golden tarot app? No, I use oh, the one I have. Osho, Osho Zen Tarot app, which oh, okay. is um, if you're familiar with Wild Wild Country, which was a Netflix documentary about um, a, a group in Oregon in the 80s that was on a commune and had some problems with the local community. Their guru is Osho. It is the one and same Osho. Excellent tarot deck. But uh, today we're going to use one called the Wild Unknown which is by Kim Carnes and uh, all of the imagery in this are, is all animal based. So there are no people represented, which I really like. Oh, that's really cool. That's actually very clever. Yeah. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Let's transition into talking about your experience and practice with tarot. I was, I was, I was a practicing Wiccan for a a Mm -hmm. brief number of years um, during my 
during my post Catholic religious exploration. Which well, I what think- happened to the most of us Catholics? We, yeah. <laughs> we either go wicked or pagan after <laughs> we're yeah. done. One extreme to the next, um, but oh. and, and um and and I still have many friends who still practice. I, sure. I, I I I've I've moved on, um, but uh, I still do. I, I have the Golden Tarot app on my on my phone. It's 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 mm-hmm. become kind of a. I do think it's important for a person to have a ritual of some kind, and that's that that's mine. Um, that and watching the Super Bowl every year because it's on a Sunday, so at least I'm trying. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's so where, so you mentioned that your, your therapist is the one that, that introduced you to all this. Yeah. Yeah. My therapist was the most, I started going to therapy after my grandmother passed away in the summer of 2014. And, uh, you know, most people have to sort of like dating, try a few different people (laughs) before it works out, but I really lucked out the first therapist I went to, I'm still with her seven years later. And actually she was like, Hey, I think. You, you're, you're practicing other modalities now. I think we can pull back a little bit. I was like, okay, great. Like, that's my, amazing. Um, but she is, you know, I used to call her my white witch or my like magical spirit guide um, in many ways because she really did open my eyes to uh, spirituality and, and creating my own practice. You know, I don't really label myself in any one way, shape or form, other than I will often say I'm a witch. Um, because I think that that has, it, it's a, it can be a loaded word for a lot of people. But the thing that I like about it is that it allows me to have a personal practice. that's truly personal, you know, that some things that even my best friend who she and I do a lot of things together, we have different ways of practicing our own spirituality, our personal experience with our highest powers, our spirit guides, our ancestors. So, um, yeah, she, my therapist really allowed me to open the door to this exploration. And that was, that's been going on seven years now. That's really that, that, you know, I stay, stay on the terror thing, but also like with, with the mental thing, like I, I, I tried therapy. It, it wasn't for me. Um, but I also had a really difficult not fun experience with it so it's one of those it's like eh, I'm, I'm good but it's glad i'm glad that it's that it's been working well for you that you were able to find uh, someone that you connected really well with and that through that you were introduced to something that's become a major part of your life now yeah. um and how have you how have you worked you know not just through therapy but you've now gone on to incorporate this more into your to your life at large as well absolutely um you know i i like to say that tarot is there are a few different ways to express it, but it's, it's a visual or an external expression of information that we hold within ourselves. So it's information that we have in our heart, in our spirit, in our gut, but has it going back to the communications, right? People that don't know necessarily how to express the thing to the rest of the world. The tarot to me, it's, is like a communications consultant. It, it visually or physically expresses something within us that we haven't quite wrapped our heads around or we don't know how to articulate or we don't know how to verbalize. We don't know necessarily how to access this internal information. And then the cards show up and they just show us. They show us what, what it is that we're either grappling with or maybe we have a question specifically about something a way forward. Um, and so the tarot, uh, you know, so it's, I love these conversations because they're so organic, you know, commu- communication, mental health, the tarot to me, it's all wrapped up in the same thing. And that, I, I, that's, I think something that, uh, a lot of people miss out on is, is finding ways to take all these aspects of, of your life and find a way to kind of make them sync up with each other. Like you mentioned, the, the communication and, and the therapy, the, the tarot and all that, and the ways that they could be mutually beneficial to each other. Absolutely. And when you asked earlier about, you know, what the pandemic, like my experience during the pandemic, ultimately it was about polishing the other facets of myself besides Broadway, theater, this one thing that had always sort of dominated my life, you know, for almost <laughs> 30 odd years. And all of a sudden... Now I'm welcoming in every aspect of myself to everything that I'm doing. You know, I'm in advertising meetings for a 
holiday show that I'm going to be announcing this summer. That's going to be a great little off Broadway show and technology keeps getting screwed up. And I'm not embarrassed to say, well, Mercury's still in retrograde. So we should have used that. In the middle of an off Broadway advertising meeting, I'm talking about Mercury retrograde and like, there's no reason I should be, but there's also no reason I shouldn't be because if we can't get our technology to work, don't freak out about it, folks. This is going to happen three times a year for six to seven weeks. Like that's just the stars. That's how it happens. So, you know, I think that as you say, like bringing all of the facets, all of the aspects to ourselves of, of ourselves to every table that we're, whether we're welcome to the table or we're showing up and flipping the table you know, it's important to bring all of us to every one of those moments. I love the idea of flipping a table. I don't know why it's just, I love it. <laughs> just show up and just flip the table over. We're not doing this this way anymore. Yeah, um, precisely. precisely. Because that's a lot of what the last year has offered us too. We've seen a lot of systems and structures that don't work. So let's start flipping the tables and seeing what's underneath and how we can excavate it and find some pieces to build a new table. So before we before we get to the the, the main event, as it were, we're, we're going to do a, a tarot reading on the show here. Uh, I'm going to read from some cards of my own through our, our pod decks app, which they have a, a special deck called the future freaks me out. And Excellent. I thought this was a good one for for what we're going to do here. These are just some fun, casual questions, which you guys can get on the pod decks app. Check it out right now. Um, to start things off, let's go with, uh, what do you think people will rebel against in the future? Ooh, what will people rebel against? Well, teenagers are always going to rebel against their parents. So, I mean, that's not going to change. I mean, rather not even teenagers, humans are always going to rebel against their, uh, against the systems and structures and things that they feel don't suit them or that they know better you know? And so I think that we're going to continue to see things that haven't been working being tested and, and rebelled against and pushed against until they topple that we can create something that, that does work. Yeah. That's yeah. I, a lot of my, I, I look back on a lot of the mistakes and mistakes, decisions I've made in life and 99% of them were the sole purpose of pissing off my parents. You know, I mean, it <laughs> got engaged at 19 because I figured it would piss my parents off. So, yeah, yeah. didn't work yeah. out, but it's fine. Um, what is one thing you worry about when it comes to your future? Oh, only one. <laughs> I mean, you, I, playing it safe for one. If you got more, go nuts. <laughs> uh... Ultimately, I think that it is, are we, how, uh, I'm, I'm worried about how we're contributing to speeding up our floating rock in the universe's death. You know, I mean, I've been watching, there's a series on Discovery Plus called How the Universe Works. You know, it's probably been on TV for, I don't know, 10 years, maybe more. I'm not sure. I have just learned about it. And I've been binging this show, learning literally about how things in the universe work, starting with the Big Bang and moving all the way through, you know, supernovas. And it's like they have these <laughs> theore theoretical physics professors and like these people that do all this crazy stuff with science and the universe and talking about subatomic particles and things. And so... I'm less worried about things because I know we're all connected and there's so much more beyond us and beyond, you know, this sliver of time that we're living in, but it's still a little scary to think about how we're uh, progressing our own decline. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. I, uh, my, my youngest, my youngest brother is uh, very environmentally conscious, very green. Um, and, before we started college, he was starting to try to encourage us all to do different things. I was, I was living with everybody at the time. And so like little things, like we started using glass containers instead of plastic ones. Um, and now I'm, I'm, I'm hooked. Now I'm like, they're, Oh my God, these are so, they don't get that weird orange tint on them when you hold spaghetti sauce on in, in them for one, 
they're easier to clean. Um, and, and they uh, look better in the fridge. They make your leftovers look yeah. more inviting. You're like, oh, I actually think I want to eat those leftovers because they yeah. look good on those cute glass containers. It's like you have fine china for your leftovers. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, and uh, so I love those. Uh, you know, uh, I've become a lot more big on recycling. Um, I bought. I just bought my house last fall, needed a lawnmower, bought an electric one. Um, And even last night, you know, it was 4th of July last night and uh, driving around, coming home from work when all the fireworks going off, all that was going through my mind was like, all these explosions have got to be terrible for the environment. All this crap in the air has got to be so bad for the environment. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah, it's it's. Look, I, I always go well, back. I mean, to- hey, look at us in New York City this week. We had a heat wave and we got an emergency alert on our cell phones like it was an amber alert saying, please turn off your big appliances and your air conditioners. And it's mm-hmm. like, excuse me, did you turn off Times Square? <laughs> I live in I live in Ohio. We get in, in southeast Ohio. We southwest. Ohio. We get those a lot, too, where they'll say like. You know, they'll let us know, you know, pollution levels, heat levels are going to be this. Like, don't go out and drive your car unless you have to. Like, cause especially, you know, we're in such an automotive town. So I thought I heard that Southwest. Yeah. Ohio, uh, I'm, from, I'm from all over. I'm from all over. But I'm yeah. from Pittsburgh, so I heard a little of that. Uh, okay. Oh, I, was, see, I was born in Erie. So. Uh-huh. I can hear it. I can uh-huh. hear it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but yeah, like I remember just driving home last night. I was just like. All of this, this has got to be so bad for the environment. When yeah. did I start giving a crap? What the- <laughs> Thanks, little bro. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I always go, I just, I always default to that because, you know, whenever people, well, because there are those out there who is like, why do you care so much? I default to the quote from, from Guardians of the Galaxy. Why do you care so much about the galaxy? Because I'm one of the idiots who lives here. Right. <laughs> why do I care so much about the planet? Because I live on it. You know? Right. Yeah. Um, so our uh, last one I want to get to, and then we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get to this, this tarot reading. Um, what is something you w- could, if you could purge one thing from your life mm-hmm. to improve your future, what would it be? Oh gosh. Self doubt and imposter syndrome. Oh yeah. Because the, to me, they're one and the same. So, you know, sure. it's, it, it's the, the, any sort of old stories that, don't actually have truth to them that have caused me to undercut myself in all kinds of different ways that I probably don't even know about, you know, I haven't even become aware of. Um, But part of my journey through therapy has been incredible self-awareness. And so, you know, I think I've done a really good job in eliminating a lot of that self-doubt and imposter syndrome, but it certainly comes up again, you know, even earlier this year, when I started working on this new show that's coming in this fall, I was like, am I, am I qualified to do this? It's like, bitch, you've got 20 Broadway shows on your resume. You're fine. Like (laughs) you'll figure it out. Even if you don't know how to do it, you'll figure it out, you know, but that there was a really deep moment of, of, Oh my God, I, I haven't, I haven't done this in a year and a half more. It's been, you know, many years since I've worked off Broadway. Oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Um, you know, but what are any of us doing here? We're all making it up as we go along. Yeah. I'm just trying to make sure I have clean underwear every single day. That's all I care about. Yeah, right. That's all, I need. all right. So, uh, and, and we're, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap some stuff up in a bit, but first I, I'm, I'm excited to do this cause I haven't done, had anybody do this for me in a long time. So, uh, Emily, Emily's going to do a tarot card reading, uh, uh, here on the show for us. So let's, let's get yeah. into this. I'm gonna let you do, go. You take the range, you know, you know what to Great. do from here. So we're going to do a three card pool today. Um, uh, for those that are not familiar with the tarot deck, I apologize for the shuffling. There'll be a little bit of that you'll hear, but also I want to give you a quick rundown of how a tarot deck is set up. So there are two halves of the deck, the major arcana and the minor arcana. And halves are, well, that's a misnomer because there are two parts of the deck. The major arcana are our magic cards. When they show up, we want to pay extra special attention to them. Uh, They also correspond to the human soul's evolution uh, through enlightenment. So it starts with the pool, which is our zero card. 
all the way up through the world, which is card number 21. So there are 22 of them. Um, and the fool is very much sort of in a way we go very, and we're off, you know, yellow brick road, very fresh energy at the very beginning of a journey. And it sort of cycles through twice, right? We have two, two or three moments in the deck where, you know, things might feel like they are, uh, really challenging. And then we get another sort of uplifting card coming after it. So the major arcana moves through that human soul's evolution. The minor arcana is set up much like a traditional playing deck. We have four suits, ace through 10. The biggest difference is we have four court cards instead of three. So usually it will be a king and a queen and either a knight and a page or a prince and a princess. This particular deck uh, uses the traditional family structure of mother, father, son, and daughter. Um, and as I said, this is the Wild Unknown, which is by Kim Carnes and uses all animal imagery instead of humans in all of it. So uh, they're really beautiful cards. And I didn't know if there was anything in particular you wanted to explore today or if you wanted to do a general reading. I, well, you know, I'd love to do a general reading. Just okay. keep it simple. Great. So the first thing you're going to do is cut the cards. So I'm going to flip through them and you're going to tell me when to stop. Okay. Stop. All right. So one of my favorite three card readings is what will help you, what will hinder you, and what is your unrealized or untapped potential. Okay. And so that's what we're going to do today. I love it. Yeah. So uh, I will uh, explain more if, as the cards specifically come up, but for anyone that's listening and is curious about the tarot, um, or about a reading, um, you can, you know, find, Google it, look online. I mean, there are so many different people practicing. It's not hard to find somebody either near you or doing virtual readings. Um, and you can also learn about the cards themselves, what the different meanings are, things like that. So if any of these cards that come up re today resonate with you, I encourage you to go do Google and see, see what, see what it says. You have Google machines in your pockets, folks everywhere you're using one to listen to this <laughs> you can multitask all right so we ready for the first one absolutely great so this is what will help you Ooh, the ten of cups so remember i said the four suits have um their four different uh you know like a traditional playing deck mm -hmm. so our four suits also correspond to the four elements so our wands are our fire, that's our creativity, our passion, our drive. Cups are our emotions, our feelings, that's water. Swords are air, which is intellect, mental ability, communication, knowledge, like uh, book knowledge. And then finally, uh, pentacles or discs are our earth, and that is our physical, our material, our manifest. And so here we have the Ten of Cups. And the Ace through Ten cards similarly to the major arcana sort of correspond to like a journey in life, right? We start the ace is like very new energy and the 10 is very full energy. And the 10 of cups oftentimes is saying to us like, you're, it's sort of like a full heart, your cup is full, right? And so this is saying what will help you is that your cup is already full the whatever emotional experiences you might have, you know, people might try and slosh your slosh some things out of your cup, but ultimately your cup is always full because it's yours and you choose that. Okay. And so this is, I love this card. I mean, the colors are so beautiful. You see that it's sort of got a weave, a web that's been woven of these, of these cups all together in this sort of rainbow pattern. It's really, really beautiful. And when you feel into it, I'm curious if there's anything that's resonating for you. Typically when I hear the phrase, you know, uh, you know, the, your cup is full. Uh, a lot of times what I think I, I feel is um, I like to take on a million different things. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a project heavy guy. Mm -hmm. um, I love to stay busy. Yep. And so what I'm, what I'm, what I'm taking from this is, uh, is, is it might be time to start cutting back a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I'm taking from this little, uh, is, is yeah. I guess between this and, and the job and 
doing stand up and and, mm-hmm. and writing directing things like that it's like okay maybe it's time to scale back a little bit so mm-hmm. and i did have to just do that with my budget too because houses are expensive <laughs> but, uh, uh-huh. yeah <laughs> but it keeps mind too right this is this is our cups this is our emotional yeah. So this is, this is our feelings. This is our heart. This is what is happening. So while yes, that might correspond to how your heart moves through the world with all the different projects, Mm -hmm. you know, because I can guess simply by our connection and communication and in this episode today, that when you are involved in something, you do put your whole heart into it. And so that's probably what it's saying to you is, you know, if you're getting this feeling of, I need to pull back from some of these things that I'm doing, maybe it's that you need to pull your heart back from it a little bit. You can still be involved. You can still, you know, be a participant, but maybe you're not the leader. Maybe you're not a hundred percent in the pool that day. You're just like, you know, swinging your legs off the side that it's not always up to you to carry the bucket for everybody else's feelings. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. No, yeah. I, you, t- I tend to be the. Oh, I, t- I tend to be the uh, the everyone's shoulder to cry on. Mm-hmm. Always have been my whole life. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, Great. that yeah. And I think what this is saying is like, what will help you is that remembering like you're your own shoulder to cry on first and foremost, mm. and without that permission for yourself and that focus on yourself in that sense, like you're not going to be able to support any of the people that you love. Makes a lot of sense. I'm moving and moving forward. It makes right. a lot of sense. All right. Let's move so, on to the next one. Yeah. So this is what will hinder you. Ooh, we have strength. So strength is one of our major arcana cards. <laughs> And it is card number, oh, in this deck, it's 11. Strength and justice are sometimes uh, inverted. So you might find one is eight and the other one's 11 in different decks. So in this deck, strength is, is 11. And that comes a little more than halfway through our major arcana. Oh, well, I guess it is about the halfway point of our major arcana. You know, it's the 12th card. So this is moving through this journey of the soul's evolution. And if you're able to watch on video, you'll see that this is upside down. If not, I just told you. And oftentimes <laughs> when people read tarot and they see this, they, it's called a reversal or an inversion. Um, folks will oftentimes read this as the negative interpretation or, you know, the lower vibe interpretation of a card. I personally read every card as though it has the entire spectrum of its meaning, no matter if it's upright or reversed. I like to read reversals as an internal ter- interpretation of this versus an external, right? So we were just talking about this 10 of cups and how it deals with everybody sort of else around you as well. This strength, I think, ties into that because this is saying like, what will hinder you is like not holding the strength yourself within yourself. That not remembering that you have that internal strength. I mean, this is the imagery of this card is so beautiful. It's a lion. I love it. With an infinity symbol over its third eye. The sun is shining down on it. It looks like it's a Leo card. You know, it looks like it's like the the absolute astrological Leo interpretation. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is a rose in the, in the mouth of the lion. We can see that it Mm -hmm. is, you know, he's holding it very gently, very, very gently. And it's, we don't know if there are thorns or not, but we can see it. it's a lion with a rose in its mouth. Mm. And so it's, you know, I think that this is saying too, we are, as you're talking about being the shoulder for everyone else and having an overfull plate and like this, maybe this is like what will hinder you is like not remembering your own strength and remembering that strength isn't always crushing. Sometimes strength is really delicate. Uh, that's the, the rose in the mouth is what always makes me think of that, that the strength is, is strength can be really delicate. You know, it's not always a crushing power. Um, and, and I'm trying to like tap in a little deep, more deeply, but what is this saying for you? 
what are you getting? I mean, for me, you know, I, we, we've talked a lot about mental health today uh, on the show. I mean, I, uh, you know, self-esteem, self-confidence has always been a big struggle of mine. Um, you know, I, I grew up in the nineties where being geeky and overweight wasn't okay. So right. that's, that's shaped a lot of, of, you know, I wouldn't be doing, I wouldn't do stand up if, if everything was holly and jolly, I do stand up because everything, you know, there are times where I feel like everything sucks. So, um, absolutely, you know, it definitely has been my, my biggest, my biggest, uh, to, to use the word hindrance, uh, mm-hmm. throughout life has always been, uh, looking inward. Uh, on myself and this is i think this is saying like you have the strength to do it and not doing it might be the hindrance okay like i mean it kind of goes back to the head in the sand thing right it's like Mm -hmm. you're you're not going to do it until you're ready but you're never going to feel like you're ready right you know some i mean sometimes it's a matter of this thing that has served me for so long really does no longer feel good. Like really does not feel good anymore. You know, whether it's something like smoking or eating sugar or, you know, whatever, all the wine we want to have, whatever it is. I mean, it can be anything. It can be binging shows. It can be playing games on our phone. It can be sex, like whatever the thing is that helps us to sort of um, turn off those feeling receptors because it feels like it is too much. Like this, I think is saying, reminding you, like you have the strength to turn them back on and, and move through it. Okay. I like that. Uh, it, which is a weird thing to say, but no, I, I like that. I like that. I like that insight. I like that interpretation a lot. I think that definitely speaks to um, a lot of things I struggle with internally on a day-to-day basis, especially. Yeah. All right, I'm ready for what is your unrealized and untapped potential? I'm 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 hoping it's like the chosen one to bring down the dark side, but yes, let's let's do this. Well, this is the five of pentacles, which is looks like it's a dying rose. A little bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, the, so remember our pentacles are our physical, our manifest, our earth. And this is the five, so it's about halfway through. And this is about, you know, to me, it's like, it's, it's almost like tending your garden, right? It's, it's taking off the dead leaves and so that the plant can focus its energy on growing and moving forward. And I think this literally is the, this is like the physical manifestation of what we just said about the things that no longer feel good. Mm -hmm. And letting go of that shit, you know, when it doesn't feel good anymore, if it doesn't serve you, then why do we keep doing it? Because it was comfort, it was comforting at one point, or it felt like it kept us safe at one point. And it probably did for wherever we were in the world, through our experience, through the programming that had been given to us, you know, through society and our families and everybody just kind of trying to do their best, but still not, I mean, you know, we're all out here flailing like a bunch of idiots on a rock floating in the middle of the world, you know, the universe, like (laughs) none of us really know what we're doing, but drop in the shit that doesn't serve us anymore. Like that's how we, we get to tap into our real potential. No, that makes a lot of sense. I I think, for myself, and I think a lot of people can relate to this too, but for myself, especially like there, I, I get attached to things and people, um, a little too easily. I tend, I tend to, uh, uh, what's your sign? Uh, I'm a Capricorn. Uh Uh-huh. But you probably have like a, your rising is probably like cancer or Pisces or something. Maybe, do you know? I have no idea. Yeah. I have no clue. You feel like you have that like very watery, energy with you as well i could be very wrong though but for me like i know um i I tend to uh like i just i don't like to let stuff go sure and uh yeah i can blame that on being irish too but uh yeah i tend to just i i add emotional value to i mean like everything 
Mm-hmm. Everything's an emotional experience for me. So That's uh, why I said it has to be, you have to have some Pisces or Cancer in there somewhere. Could be. But uh, yeah, it's so true, Mike, because when you are moving through the world, you're experiencing things through your like fixed earth cancer. Is it fixed, right? Isn't it? I don't know. I'm my astrology is not as strong as my tarot. I apologize. <laughs> But, um, you know, you're moving through that very earthy sign. And that's your sun sign. That's yeah. how you move through the world. Your rising is oftentimes how other people see you move through the world. But that's, that's very common, you know. And for all of us, too, right? Not just for, for Capricorns, but for all of us to find something. And we're like, oh, gosh, thank goodness this works. This is the thing. This is the magic bullet. And then, you know, maybe it is for a while. But then we grow and change and evolve ourselves. You know, I mean, whether it's an emotional evolution, a mental evolution, physically, none of us are the same literal like cell being that we were even, you know, what, like five years ago. I mean, our cells are constantly changing and evolving and dying and building new ones so our physical form is doing it anyway shedding that which no longer serves us but our spiritual our emotional our mental selves struggle with doing the same i mean yeah no that 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 that, that, that resonates for sure absolutely um yeah i'm not sure i'm not sure what else to add to that <laughs> yeah no, no, yeah, that, that definitely resonates with me a lot. For cool. Sure. Well, Emily, cool. thank you. That was, that was, that, I haven't had anybody do a reading for me since, oh my God, I don't even know the last time was. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much. I re- really appreciate that. And I know that most folks are listening here, but I did just want to hold up these three so you can sort of see them together and I'll I, take a picture and send them to you as well. So you have it. I love the, uh, I love the artwork. I love how it looks, you know, like that hand-drawn pencil look. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I love it. It looks great. Yeah. Fantastic. So let's 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 take one step uh, back a little bit because I, I did want to bring this up because I'd, I'd feel remiss if I didn't. Um, a little bit into the into the to the Broadway side of things. I want to talk about uh, the pink tank. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to know more about the pink tank for people, for other people, people listening or watching to know a little bit more about the pink tank and what that is. So what is the pink tank? Thank you for asking. So in full disclosure, the pink tank is currently on pause because as you said, there's a lot of things happening and it was like, you know what, what is something that I can pull back from myself a little bit, but the pink tank is uh, a group of women who we started meeting after the very first women's day on Broadway the second Women's Day on Broadway, um, which Disney Theatrical has put on for the industry for some panels and conversations about, uh, you know, what's happening in the Broadway industry and how it affects women. And uh, so we started gathering just to have some wine and sort of decompress and talk about the day. And we found that it was something that we all kind of needed and wanted. And so we began to gather every month uh, to hold support hold space for and support each other. And it it was an early sort of pre recognition of what you and I talked about of bringing all the facets of ourselves to everything that we do. And so it was a lot about integrating both the personal and the professional and moving through the world because ultimately we can't, they, they, they affect each other more than anyone would ever know, right? And this last year has taught us that too, with everyone's at home Zoom meetings and seeing, you know, kids and dogs and all the delivery guys showing up, all of the insanity that happens. We all experience this. So why are we moving through the world at work pretending that it's not happening? So the pink tank was really an opportunity for majority freelance or independent contractor or consultant uh, focused folks, you know, were mostly either in the business side of the business or producers, directors, writers, uh, fewer multi-hyphenates. And it was just an opportunity for us to come together and explore where the personal and the professional are, are intersecting and how we can support each other in that way. 
And so we met physically in person here in New York for about a year. And then the pandemic hit. So we did a year plus uh, virtual meetings. And this past June, I actually, or late May, early June, decided that we were going to put it on pause until there was an opportunity for us to start to gather in person again, even though that was sort of happening at the same time. It was just one thing that I didn't quite have the capacity to continue moving forward with at this time. But we've got about 30 women uh, all across the country and world now. We've got one who's over, two over in Europe, a couple out in LA. So it's been fun during the pandemic to be able to expand our, our collective and our group. But uh, yeah, so that the Pink Tank is, is a great, great gathering. And it will be again when we return. Well, I hope it gets to get back together. I mean, obviously your availability and, and busy life, not, you know, notwithstanding, but I hope you're able to, uh, you know, get that going again. I think it's, it's, it's great that you put something like that together. You know, I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, you think when people think Broadway and they think musicals and they think, you know, they think it's gotta, they don't realize like even something that can sometimes be, you know, considered for lack of a better word, feminine in nature still a very guy driven I mean, it's the entertainment industry. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, you think about it. We have a running joke with one of my clients. Um, <laughs> we call the theater owners, the five families. <laughs> so I've now started calling them Lacosa Broadway. Um, there are, to be clear, there are three families, three family owned organizations that run the majority of the Broadway theaters. Um, and then a few of the nonprofits own a few more. So you know, doesn't quite translate, but it does because these people are the gatekeepers. You know, if the broad, if you can't get a theater for your Broadway show, you don't have a Broadway show. So ultimately the theater owners are the gatekeepers and they're all pretty much old straight white dudes. You know, most of the leadership in these organizations, not all of them, but you know, the majority of them are baby boomers. Mm -hmm. They're not even, you know, like Gen X. (laughs) that right. are coming in like with some other fresher ideas. Uh, so, you know, we're just out here doing what we can do to be a squeaky wheel and remind people that there are other people out here. Squeak that wheel. Um, and then you, uh, you mentioned uh, in, in we, I, I saw this on your, on your, in your biography of uh, something called Emily's the Broadway Tarot. Yeah, I'm working on my own tarot deck. That's a Broadway tarot deck. So that's something that is in process as well. It's in development. Uh, so like a Broadway, like Broadway theme cards. Yes, exactly. Oh my god, I almost, I, I want, I want to get one just, to, just to have it. Like, yeah, like, with a perfect. there will be a, a a companion book that goes along with it, talking about why each of the characters was cast as the card they were, and how uh, that card sort of manifests itself. My, I guess, then I guess the question I have to follow that follow up on that is: Is the Book of Mormon involved in the deck? <laughs> Not so far. Let's see. You know, let's see so. where the Book of Mormon falls into a tarot deck. That's just. I feel like that's what the guys at South Park would have wanted. <laughs> no, I'm gonna ask them. I'm not sure. Um, that's just I. I love that idea. I love that idea of a Broadway theme. Broadway. That's such a great idea. Um, Emily, before we let you go here, uh, one thing I do like to do with, with the guests when they come on, you know, I spend 30 minutes to an hour throwing questions at you, like it's darts at a dartboard. So I want to turn the, uh, tur- turn the reins back to you once again, even though you kind of did already do this already. Uh, but, uh, give you a chance to ask me any two questions you want to ask. Um, have you ever read tarot before? Uh, when I was practicing, was a practicing Wiccan in, in college and all that. I, I had a deck. Uh, it was the, uh, the, the Celtic cross deck that everybody can get at books a million. Um, but yeah, that's the one that I had. And I read that for, I did that for a few years. Um, I still have it. Some it's packed in a box somewhere here in the house. I still haven't finished the packing in my house yet, but yeah, it's here somewhere in the house. Will you do a reading for yourself when you unpack it? I will. Because you asked, I will, I will do so. Awesome. As soon as I find it. I don't know what box it's in. <laughs> There's a whole room in my house that is just boxes. I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> when, you come, when you come across it, 
you know. I will let you. I will. Let, I'll, I'll Zoom call you when I find it, and we'll <laughs> we'll 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 I'll I'll do it for you. <laughs> a lot. Well, Emily McGill, Broadway communications, PR, tarot. Good Lord, um, you, you do it all, and you found time to to sit down and talk with us for for a while. And I can't thank you enough for for coming on the show today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, is there anything you want, any, anywhere you want to direct people who are watching or listening, website, social media, what have you, where would you like to direct the people to, to learn yeah, more absolutely. about you? Uh, you can follow me. Instagram is really the only social that I tend to care about. I have the others, but I like Instagram. It's my fave. So I'm at Emily Ann, A-N-N-E, M-C-G. Emily Ann MCG on Instagram and my website is Emily McGill entertainment. And if you're interested in booking a tarot reading, you can certainly do that. We've got options for a single card, a three card or an hour long seven card pull. So um, whatever suits suits a folks uh, preference, we have an option for you. Fantastic. Make sure you guys head over, check or check out Instagram. Yeah. Instagram is the only one that really I can get new music, movie trailers and cat pictures in, in a single app. What more do you need in life? I, I need nothing else. I like plant Instagram too. It's that really too. stellar. Yeah. And food Instagram. I love to eat. Um, <laughs> so check, follow Emily on Instagram. Check out her website. If you're interested in a tarot, in a tarot card reading, make sure you go ahead and book her right away. And uh, Emily, we are going to, we are going to, we're going to bid you adieu here. And, and thank you once again, this was, this was so much fun. Thank, thank you for you. taking the time. Absolutely. Have a great day. Learned a little bit about me in the process. That was fun. <laughs> um, but I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. Remember, once again, this show is sponsored by Poddex. Go over to poddex.com. Use the code TBL10 to get 10% off your order at checkout. We do this every single month, and uh, we we love we love having the people on. And we will do one again next month as well. And always as always, check out new episodes of the Basement Lounge podcast every single Thursday with me and Mike Wells on the mic. And until next time, as always, live well, rock on, take care. Bye-bye.